Good evening. My name is Thad Zolkowski. I'm the Associate Director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, which is supported by a generous grant from Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation. The writing of biography is a famously arduous and lengthy process, and each year we award four fellowships of $72,000 each to working biographers to help them across the finish line. Over the past 11 years, we have given out 44 of these grants, and our fellows have produced 21 biographies to date. Thanks to a grant from the Sloan Foundation, we recently added a fifth fellowship, also for $72,000, which will support biographies about figures in science and technology. The first winner is working on a biography of Oliver Sacks, Laura Snyder. Another new feature of the center is a unique two-year MA in biography and memoir, which will train students in archival and historical research, interview technique, and narrative form, as well as the history of biography and memoir and how these forms have evolved over time. Housed jointly in the history and English departments and directed by historian Sarah Covington, the program is currently accepting its first class of students who will begin study in the fall of 2019. And one of the MA program's prestigious and award-winning faculty is tonight's main speaker, Brenda Wineapple, who is also a former director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography. Wineapple is the author of remarkably original and stylishly written books, Ecstatic Nation, Confidence, Crisis, and Compromise, 1848 to 1877, a New York Times notable book, White Heat, The Friendship of Emily Dickinson and Thomas Wentworth Higginson, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, Genet, a biography of Janet Flanner, Sister, Brother, Gertrude and Leo Stein, and Hawthorne, A Life, which received the Ambassador Award. Wineapple is joined by Eric Foner, DeWitt Clinton Professor, Professor Emeritus of History at Columbia University, and the author of numerous books on American history, including Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1877, which was a must have when I was in graduate school, and The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln and American Slavery, both winners of the coveted Bancroft Prize. His latest book, The Second Founding, How the Civil War and Reconstruction Remade the Constitution, will appear in September. Tonight, in the final event of our spring season, Eric Foner will engage Brenda Wineapple in a conversation about her widely acclaimed new book, The Impeachers, The Trial of Andrew Johnson and the Dream of a Just Nation, which may have one or two parallels to the current political situation, but I will let our two historians weigh in on that. Afterwards, I will pass around a mic to audience members who would like to ask a question. I should also mention that copies of the Impeachers are on sale courtesy of Books on Call NYC, and Brenda Wineapple will be happy to sign them. Please welcome Brenda Wineapple and Eric Foner. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you all for coming out this evening to talk about, to hear and talk about Brenda Wineapple's excellent new book, The Impeachers. Um, it's a um, uh, interesting phenomenon that the um, presidential election of 2016 and what's happened since has kind of rekindled a lot of interest in Reconstruction, the period after the American Civil War. <laughs> I couldn't hear what he said, but I'm sure it was not. <laughs> I'm sure it was not important anyway. What is the problem? Uh, oh, what's wrong? Is my mic not picking up my uh, voice? All right, well, uh, there we go. All right. Anyway, uh, Reconstruction is kind of on the agenda nowadays. Uh, issues of that period, whether it's who, is, who should be a citizen, who should have the right to vote, uh, things like that are, you know, very much on the political agenda now. Um, I will not mention he who must not be named until... <laughs> 
maybe the very end, where this is about history and the first impeachment, Andrew Johnson, in 1868. But um, to begin, I'd like to ask Brenda, um, you know, how she got interested in this subject. Anyone who's written a book knows that it takes quite a few years to do so. So she didn't just run into the archive when the Mueller report appeared <laughs> and then sure published I did. this book. Um, so I presume it originated when President Obama was in office yes. and not too many people were talking about impeachment. No. So what, what was it that interested you about this? Well, first of all, I suppose, thank, thank you, Thad, for the lovely introduction. Wherever you went, there you are. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here with uh, Eric, of course, because as Thad suggested, and I will reinforce, Eric really wrote the book on Reconstruction and many of the views that are current today really come out of Eric's groundbreaking research. So having said that, um, let me go back to Eric's question. Yes, I didn't start the book yesterday or even last year. And in, in fact, when I started the book, he who should not be named was Andrew Johnson. <laughs> and when people would ask me uh, what I was working on, um, and I would say the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, a couple of things would happen. One is they either left immediately, they bolted, uh, <laughs> they headed for the door, or they thought Andrew Jackson, they said Andrew Jackson had been impeached because no one knew who Johnson was and couldn't remember. Um, or they, they assumed that, and this was, the, I think, probably more troubling than having people uh, run away from me, um, was that the impeachment uh, process and the impeachment of Johnson had been a preposterous mistake. And, and that intrigued me. And, and so to go back to Eric's question, I began the book six years ago, deep into the Obama presidency. Uh, hence, um, I was not prescient, if anyone was prescient, <laughs> who is my publisher, basically. <laughs> and I was interested because in the previous book that I'd written, as Thad mentions, called Ecstatic Nation, and it, it covers a very large period in American history before, during, and after the Civil War, you know, rather ridiculously ambitious project, but in any event, when I was working on that particular book, it seemed to me strange that the first ever impeachment of an American president, which occurred in 1868, was an event that seemed to make people's eyes glaze over. And it seemed that most people who knew, and this is not Eric, of course, but generally, you know, John Q. Public or whatever, uh, assumed we went in presidential history from Grant, I mean, from Lincoln to Grant without sort of stopping for those three years. So that and the fact that Ecstatic Nation and sort of working in that period for a while, which I'd been doing, whether it was in Hawthorne or, or dealing with Thomas Higginson, revealed to me that it was such a crucial an important time, and I kept thinking, what would it be like to be alive in 1865? The war is barely over. You have your first ever presidential assassination, the assassination of Lincoln. You, you have over 750,000 people dead, and you're, you're confronted with putting the country back together enter Andrew Johnson, and before you turn around, it's the impeachment. So that got me start, started thinking about what happened, why did it happen, who are the people involved in it, and why did we not know more about it? Those were my questions that I hope okay. to Okay, well, you've done a great job in okay, uh, answering these nice. questions, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's all to the good. Um, Different countries, I guess, have different ways of trying to get rid of mm. people who are either presidents, prime ministers, whatever. I mean, we were just talking, Theresa May in yeah. England has been kind of booted out in a coup d'etat or yeah. something by the Conservative Party. Nobody, no, no voter has anything to say about that no. in, in England. Uh, here we have a different process, but the people who wrote the original Constitution did put in the process of impeachment for a rather ambiguous phrase, right? Exactly. High crimes and misdemeanors. Treason. Mm. We, oh. and, and even treason, there's some discussion now about what treason is. Right. People seem not to know. Treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. And even if you assume you know what treason is, 
and you know, bribery when you see it. What are high crimes and misdemeanors? I mean, that really is the fuzzy terminology because theoretically, as and I think it was Sadie Stevens said, you know, a, a misdemeanor could be stealing a chicken. <laughs> would, <laughs> right. would, would you be impeached for that? Probably not, you know, in that case. But as Eric says, that, that the idea of impeachment and the process for it, the conditions, which he just named, and then what happens afterwards, that there's a trial, if the, if, the, if the officer, namely the president in this case, is impeached, then there's a trial that goes to the Senate. And, and I find, too, and you've probably all had this experience more recently, that people don't really entirely sort of understand that it's a two-pronged process. That's why you're going to have impeachment. And impeachment is the accusation, right? It's like an indictment. Right. It's a, to be and impeached then, does not mean you're convicted. No, or removed from office. Right. No. So that's itself interesting. But that's what's outlined in the Constitution. And what's interesting there, too, is that there isn't really a procedural. There, there are no procedures. You, said you should be tried. The person will be tried in the Senate. The chief justice shall preside, and to be removed from office, you need two thirds vote of the Senate. That's it. Right. That doesn't tell you very much about how to conduct that particular trial. It's really up for grabs, and it was in 1868, as it would be subsequently. Right. Do, you, do you think the uh, people who wrote the Constitution <laughs> saw impeachment more as a kind of criminal kind of process or a political process? Uh, you know, do you have to have committed a indictable crime to be uh, impeached, or is impeachment just whatever a majority of the House of Representatives says it is? If they want to get rid of the president that way, they have the right to impeach him and then have a trial of some kind before the Senate. Well, that's it's still debated now. You know, right. and I, I read, you know, there were a couple of books that came out on impeachment by constitutional lawyers in the 70s mm -hmm. um, and, you know, around the time of Nixon and then later right. because of Clinton. And, and they, would, they were arguing that it actually had to be legal action. Um, I'm not sure I entirely agree, but it depends on the day you speak to me, really. And I think that there was that ambiguity built into the Constitution because in the Federalist Papers, you see that Alexander Hamilton actually says that uh, an impeachable offense can be an abuse of power. Right. So in that particular sense, that's not a, a narrow definition. That, that's not a legalistic definition. Right. That really does have a, abuse of power significance that isn't mm -hmm. a technical difference. You know, the interesting thing about when we want to talk about the past, but just to make a point, Clinton was impeached on a narrow per, legal uh, uh, perjury. Right, or, and that's right. perjury. He perjured himself. Nobody was going to deny that. Right. But he was um, acquitted because of a broader interpretation of impeachment, which is to say, whatever he did didn't interfere with the way he conducted affairs of state. So it's, you know, we don't want to talk about affairs ways. of state. With well, that, yeah, 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 no, no pun intended. But, um, Thank you. <laughs> I saved. So th this is a uh, biography center. The book is not a biography per se, although Andrew Johnson is very central to it, his sure. entire life and career. And uh, but it does have a very broad cast of characters with a very helpful little, uh, uh, you know, uh, summaries of in who the they back. are. Yeah, in the front in the, the back, back there. Yeah. But, um, but look, what about Andrew Johnson? I mean, as you said, he's not exactly a household name. But now he will be. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, his reputation, I guess, like many figures of our history, has gone up and down over the years. The Hi. Original scholars on Reconstruction, the Dunning School, actually didn't like him very much. No, Dunning they didn't. thought he was inept. He didn't yes. understand what the country needed after the Civil War. Then in the 1920s, he becomes like the heroic. Hero. Hero. As the radical Republicans decline in reputation, he becomes the heroic defender of the Constitution. Today, his, it's like a stock market ticker is back down again, partly right. thanks to your book and other books. <laughs> Uh, he's widely seen as the worst or possibly next to the worst president there are uh, in American history. There are other contenders now, but... Um, <laughs> but uh, you think? 
Yeah, but uh, Johnson is way down there. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. What is your view? I mean, there are, there are, even though there are all sorts of Andrew Johnsons out there in the historical literature, I mean, is he, is he just an inept politician, or is he a shrewd uh, schemer, or is he just a guy whose racism blinded him to anything else? Um, you know, what's your take on Andrew Johnson before he gets to be impeached? Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting, the sort of three things that you, you sort of enumerate. Is he an inept? Is, you know, is he strategic? I mean, is the, you know, or is he just sort of blinded by his racism? And in a certain sense, all three, I would say. But the interesting thing about Johnson, and, and one of the ways in which he got on the ticket, Lincoln's ticket in 1864, had to do with the fact that many in the North in 1864 and for four years before admired Andrew Johnson enormously as a man of courage, true courage. And I think that had we been alive in 1860, 61, we may have shared that view. He was the only United States Senator from the South, he represented Tennessee, who stood up against the secessionists in the so-called secession winter of 1860-61 after Lincoln was elected. And he said, I'm against secession. I, I'm for the Union. You know, I won't have anything to do with it. We must stay within the Union. I will fight for the Union. And whatever credibility he had among Southerners was shot. He was burned <coughs> in effigy from one end of Tennessee to the other. He, he was constantly being threatened, and his family was threatened with assassination. So it was a very heroic, lonely stand to take. And what his other views were, um, say, for example, on race, were not paramount in 1860, 1861, because at that juncture, the, the, the reigning idea in the North was save the Union. There were abolitionists, certainly, and anti-slavery people who wanted the war to be about something else, but not a lot of people necessarily wanted that. It wasn't a popular view. So Andrew Johnson looked great, and Lincoln then, um, put Johnson, uh, appointed Johnson military governor of Tennessee. When they ca uh, yeah. Yeah, captured when, Nashville yeah. and yeah. And, and so that was another coup in a sense for Johnson. And Lincoln is in a sense bringing him closer into the Republican party, but also Lincoln being very savvy as he was, is using Johnson too, because Johnson is this upright, unionist, southern senator, a war democrat. He's in a different party, but he's very, very, very committed to the prosecution of the war. So when 1864 rolls around and there's some dispute, I don't know what you think about, you know, to what extent Lincoln it's, was behind it, it's, the it's scenes. A, it's murky, very murky. I happen to believe that he had his finger on the scales because I feel... Yeah, he probably, although, you know, he's being too smart vice president... not to. Back then, being vice president was pretty unimportant, actually. It was unimportant except, except... From what I've understood, Hannibal Hamlin, his vice president, a great name, um, brought nothing except that name to the ticket. Well, so, he brought. He was a former Democrat. The 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 uh, Republican Party was a new party, and right. it had these. You know, it had ex Whigs, ex Democrats. Right. Lincoln was an ex Whig. They had to balance it. But Hamlin, you're right. And Lincoln was from and the West. From, Hamlin is from Maine. Right. Balance the ticket. Johnson is on to balance the ticket another way. He's opening up because, you know, after the war is over, the Republicans have to find support in the South. Exactly. And they want to, before the war is over, they want to keep the border states happy. Right. And, right. and Lincoln wants to suggest that Tennessee is really in the Union, even though it wasn't entirely in the Union. So it was, it was a very, I think, very smart political yeah. move whoever was behind yeah, it. Oh, he re Johnson represents on the ticket, as you said, a white unionism in the South. And Lincoln, who was very savvy, but also, like anyone, made errors, greatly overestimated the number of white unionists in the South. True. Johnson was supposed to be an example of this legion of people who had been right. kind of dragged into secession against their right, will, right, right, right. Uh, et cetera. But anyway. And another miscalculation. Mm -hmm. Lincoln didn't know he was going. Didn't think he was going to die. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> although mean, he did have dreams about it. Well, but, I know, uh, but you know. No, Lincoln was a young guy. He was in well, his yeah. 50s. There was no reason to think that Lincoln no, no, would not I mean, serve out his full term. You know, um, but, but Johnson, sure. uh, you know, um, when I was in graduate school, one of my mentors was Eric McKittrick, who oh, wrote yeah. the great book, uh, Andrew, Andrew Johnson, Johnson and, Reconstruction, and Reconstruction, back around 1959 or 60, which began that generation's right. process of tearing Johnson off his a pedestal. Right. Um, to, just to show you how elevated Johnson's reputation had become, as you well know, in uh, John F. Kennedy's Profiles in Courage, <laughs> which he didn't actually write, but he got the Pulitzer Prize for it anyway. <laughs> Um, Ted Sorensen. Uh, well, Nevins, Sorensen. He had a whole team. Nevins? No, yeah. Nevins. In the Nevins, go to the Nevins papers at Columbia if you yeah. have a lot of spare time. Oh, yeah. And you'll see Nevins' contributions to Profiles in Courage. No kidding. But, um, Very disappointing. But anyway, one of the profiles was Edmund Ross, one of the senators right. who voted to acquit. Right. And that was one of the great moments of courage because it saved the presidency from congressional domination and all this. By maniacs and fanatics, right. ideologues, partisans, who just wanted to tear down the presidency, tear down Andrew Johnson. And Edmund Ross, wonderful Edmund Ross, right. voted against his own party, because at the time he was right. a Republican. Now you, are jumping ahead a little in your yeah. book here, you point out Edmund Ross was not necessarily motivated purely by altruistic purposes. Ah, uh, no, you know, he what, wasn't. What, I mean, he, what was he trying to get? Well. <laughs> Lots of favors. There is, there is, I really tried very hard to find uh, uh, actual evidence of Smoke, bribery. Smoking bribery, gun. Smoking gun, you know. And as I said in the book, there's a lot of fire. It, it, there's a lot of smoke, but no fire. I could never find that evidence of actual money changing hands. But what I can tell you, and what I did find, is plenty of evidence of, of Ross going to Johnson after he cast his vote and importuning him, begging him, asking constantly, in consequence of what I've done for you for one favor, an appointment for this person, appointment for his brother, you know, an assignment here, and he constantly is coming back. So it was clearly what we'd call a quid pro quo kind of situation. And, and from what I also can tell about Ross, he was a fairly weak person. Yeah. Uh, he wanted to keep his seat. He needed money, for sure. He was sure. a senator from Kansas. From Kansas, junior senator for, from Kansas. Um, had not passed any legislation, hadn't been in office very long, and was also, just as an aside, <laughs> although it's probably important, mm -hmm. um, he was more or less smitten with this uh, young sculptor named Lavinia Vinnie Ream, mm -hmm. wh whose family was very involved in uh, contracts with Native Americans and bilking them and, uh, and sort of Confederate-leaning people. So. Mm -hmm. It's, as I said, it's a lot of smoke, <laughs> but clearly he was asking for quite a, quite a lot of favors right, done afterwards. Right, right. So, now, um, not altruistic. Johnson had made his reputation in Tennessee as the spokesman for the poorer yes. white uh, class, you know, yeoman farmers, yeah. eastern Tennessee. He, was, he owned a couple of slaves, but he wasn't a big slave owner. In fact, he denounced no. the big slave owners he for. Did. I mean, it's so it, interesting, though. That class issue is so right. interesting because, as, as Eric's suggesting, Johnson came from nothing, in, 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 almost less than nothing in a sense right. because um, his He's certainly died the when he was person young. who started poorest who ever became president. He was an indentured servant. Right. And when he and his brother ran away from the tailor shop where they were indentured, there was a wanted ad put out for him. There was a price on his head, which is, you know, it's, it's not the same as being a fugitive slave, but it's, it's pretty horrific when you think about yeah. the kind of poverty and, and the kind of youth that he had. But ironically and, and sadly, really, in a sense, or pathetically, uh, as soon as he did well and his tailor shop grew and he became very successful both in, in, in industry or whatever you want to call it, mercantile uh, business and also then in politics, the first thing he did is go out and buy slaves. He did. No, I mean, really. Well, and that's what you did with your money yeah. if you were in the South, uh, you know. The, but, but it shows, you know, how you change classes right. in a but certain sense. But Johnson, sense. when one of the mysteries about Johnson, when after he becomes president, Lincoln is assassinated, Johnson takes over. Uh, very soon after that, he 
inaugurates his reconstruction policy, which contrary to the old mythology is not the same necessarily as Lincoln's. No. But um, one, he sets up these governments in the South, all white, black people have no voice, no rights, whatever, and uh, they're free, but that's it. And uh, they can't vote, et cetera, et cetera. And anyway, but he also says that Southern people who own $20,000 worth of property, which is a pretty, lot, a lot yeah. but it's the big slave owners, are not going to be able to vote or hold office. Everyone else gets a pardon, but not them. Johnson seems to assume that, therefore, these smaller farmers will kind of take over, which doesn't happen. But then, pretty quickly, he stops that, and he starts offering pardons to all these people. How, what, what, he didn't explain why he just dropped that class-based effort. Do you have any thoughts about why Johnson sort of now begins suddenly to align himself with the planters, even though at the beginning he's saying we're going to keep them out of this whole process? Well, yeah. I mean, I think it's part of the same psychology, if you will, that mm -hmm. got him to buy slaves when he had some money. You know, there was a delegation of Fre Frederick Douglass, it was a black delegation um, that came to see him, you know, in early 1866. and. Um, he was very put out by them. And one of the things that he said that are, it, it's really so hard to imagine what he's thinking when he says to them, well, I didn't sell any of my slaves. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? You know, that you did, so, so that he's still, to me, still identifying with a planter class. So I'm not so sure that when he says that the so-called yeoman farmers or people who didn't have money automatically got pardons, that he was really thinking along the lines of restructuring the South away from what had been that mm -hmm. called the aristocracy. I think that that was OK to do and that it you know, cut muster with, with most people. But as soon as he got some power again, he begins using it in almost the same way. And now he's making the planters come to him. Right, right. They're and coming and begging pardon. for pardons. Yeah. yeah. So he's got power over these people who called him basically and this was a 19th century term, white, poor white trash, yeah. you know? And now he's saying, look who's poor white trash now, right? I of mean, course, you know, Johnson is my mentor, uh, McKittrick. His uh, yeah. argument, as you remember, was Johnson yeah. was kind of an outsider. Right. He was a, a kind of person, his personality was really his problem. His well, that, that's one of his problems. That he, he just, <laughs> he was stubborn. He didn't listen to anyone. Yeah, that's he true. could uh, succumb to flattery. Another way of looking at it is to say, well, wait a minute, he's an outsider, but this guy has, had held every single office exactly. you can hold in this country, from like alderman, alderman all the way state legislature, governor, pre senator, president. He knew the political system. Absolutely. Another way of looking at it is to say, hey, look, uh, obviously a vice president who takes over has to think about, how am I going to get reelected in 1868, <laughs> you know? And where's my coalition going to be? And you know, some people have like, well, really, Johnson is the first of these white identity politicians. Mm, he true. says, we got to unite the white man. You know, he's deeply racist. I'm fighting for the white man. The Republicans are fighting for blacks. I'll take that. I'll take that gamble. Yeah, if, if you go to the voters and say, are you for the white man or for black people? I want to be on the side of the white man. Exactly. Now, it doesn't work for Johnson because of all sorts of circumstances. But, you know, he might, it, you might. One might see him as a more calculating politician than sometimes uh, appears. But the other point, the, the, to ask you a question again, the, the other side of John, the seesaw of Johnson's reputation is the radical Republicans, who ah. were the villains of the peace yeah. for decades and decades. They were fanatics. They were yeah. vengeful. Uh, they, Diabolical. You know, or diabolical Thaddeus Stevens with his club foot, you know. And sign of that. the devil. It was considered yeah. a sign of the devil. You take a much more positive view more. of Thaddeus Stevens <laughs> and the radical Republicans. How do you see them? I do see them. And you know what's interesting when you were, I was just thinking about Stevens, for example, who was himself an outsider. You know, yeah. a lot of these people, yeah. I mean, Johnson wasn't the only outsider. Certainly Stevens came, you know, from poverty, except mm -hmm. his poverty was in Vermont as opposed to, you know, uh, North Carolina and Tennessee, but poverty nonetheless, what that kind of poverty did for him 
in a sense, is making him, to my mind, much more empathetic to other well, people. Well, just like Lincoln, who well, the would live to yeah. put. In some people, yeah. poverty makes you empathetic, and yeah. in others, it you just closes you exactly. in a, on exactly. yourself. But, the, you know, and in, in it was, in a, in a sense, the way I was taught history um, was, was it had nothing to do with McKittrick or anything like yeah. that. It was as if, it was as if um, I was getting my textbook out of Birth of a Nation. Yeah, no, me where, too, when I was know, in high school, absolutely. Where, you know, Thaddeus Stevens, the, the character for Thaddeus Stevens was, was this, depicted as this awful person with this weird wig. He did wear a weird wig, but, you know, and he was sort of dark and scary, and he was going to ruin the South, and hence comes the Ku Klux Klan to the rescue. I mean, and in a sense, that's, that's, that was the history that in some sense, actually, to a certain extent, you know, all Eric's work notwithstanding still is- Oh, it's out there. You know, still exists, Yeah, absolutely. Really. You know, in a way, don't get me started on Spielberg and Lincoln and Thaddeus Stevens and that no, one. No, you're right. And, uh, <laughs> and um, there's, there's been an effort. I somehow, uh, I have a little finger in this, to get a postage stamp of oh, Thaddeus really? Stevens. You know, there were postage stamps of I millions know. of different Americans, but Thaddeus Stevens is still blocked by whoever <laughs> determines these things. My God. Um, you know, so th this mythology yeah. of him as the vengeful, the evil genius. But what is your positive view of well, that? Well, you know, it's, no, but what's interesting about that is, was, I was just reading something today, as a matter of fact, is that this sort of the notion that people like Stevens, for example, these radical Republicans, they wanted, all they were interested in was power. Right. And, and you think, well, yeah, and this will get to the positive, the, mm -hmm. to your question. Of course they were interested in power, you know, who's not? But they're interested in power because to them it was the only way to ensure the victory that the North had fought for, which is to say equality and justice under the law and the eradication, not just of slavery, because the 13th Amendment did that, but the eradication of the effects of slavery, which you know is, is something worth thinking about, because you don't just get rid of the institution and say, oh, fine, everything's OK now. South, come on back. You know, everything's forgotten. Right. Slavery's gone. Let's move on. No. There are effects of slavery. Four million people enslaved who had been deprived of, of everything, the clothes on their back, their wages, ability to move or marry, all of those things. So a person like Thaddeus Stevens then, of course, were in the, those people were interested in power, but they were particularly interested in power because they really did believe, and this is what's astonishing, sadly astonishing, to me anyway, mm -hmm. that this is 1865, say, and I'm not even going to his earlier history, that these are people like Stevens or Sumner of Massachusetts, or, and there are many others who actually are, to my mind, visionary. They see a United States after the war that finally can make good on its promise, its promise in the Declaration of Independence, and they're, they're committed to doing that in trying to find the best way. So in that sense, that's my take, and, and I think that's very positive. They're not perfect, you know, um, right. but, but they really do have this view. And just to give one little example about Stevens, because it's so telling, when he found out the burial plot that he purchased, you know, um, was not in a cemetery that allowed black people to be buried there, he sold the plot and said, I'm going to an integrated cemetery right. because I want in death to be known for the same values I fought for in life. Right. Now, 30 years yeah. earlier, 30 years, talking about power yeah. and principle, 30 years earlier, Stevens had been a delegate to the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention, 1837, which took the right to vote away from black men in Pennsylvania. They had enjoyed it up to that point. Stevens refused to sign the Constitution right. and walked out. Now, right. what, there was no possible political benefit to him <laughs> no. in 1837 quite the opposite. for standing up for right. the rights of black people in Pennsylvania, yeah. quite the opposite. So law, and Sumner the same thing. Yeah, Sumner absolutely. Long, the radicals had been fighting for justice and equality long before the Civil War, long before Reconstruction. Suddenly, as you say, the destruction of slavery opens up this question of what is going to replace it. What is this country going to look like with four million people suddenly 
freed. Johnson, of course, has, well, you know, you quote some of the things he said to Frederick Douglass, others about black people, deeply, deeply racist. Um, and without going through the chronology of events, because I do want to get to impeachment here, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it does happen. <laughs> John, uh, Congress tries uh. to work with Johnson, he refuses, they pass civil rights legislation, he, he vetoes, vetoes it. it, they propose the 14th Amendment, he t opposes it, tells the South to reject it. Finally, they get fed up and they get rid of the governments Johnson has created and, and put into effect what they call radical reconstruction with black men now voting in the South for the first time. And then Johnson opposes that and tries to instruct that. So you have two years, really, from toward the end of 1865 toward the end of 1867, where right. there's just this accelerating battle between right. Congress and the president right. over which focuses on the, what rights these African-American right. people are going to have. Now, how does that lead to impeachment? It, again, just like anything else, there's a lot of literature. Well, there's not that much, actually, really on the isn't. impeachment. But everyone who writes about Reconstruction touches on it they in a few sentences. They didn't, they didn't sort of look at it. That's what but, was but the, the, What is the motivation for impeachment? Is it just people got fed up with Johnson? Or they just said, look, he's now violated a law. They passed a law, the Tenure of Office Act, which he violated by kicking out his Secretary of War. Um, what do you see as the motive for the House of Representatives eventually to impeach uh, Johnson? Well, the interesting thing is that it seems to me that the motive was, or the motives, were growing over time. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, and I think it's important to understand um, that impeachment didn't come overnight. Right. Oh, we've got to impeach this guy, you know, let's right. go do it. Impeachment had been kind of on a, on a, on a slow boil. And there were people um, among the radical Republicans who wanted to impeach Johnson early on. And actually, according, and, and you know, the Republicans themselves were divided. There were conservative, moderate radicals. And even the radicals had different points of view. And there were those who wanted to get, that felt Johnson was unfit for office, that he was obstructing this idea of this, this new vision of things. And besides, he was degrading Congress. He was abusive. I mean, you, the, the list is very long. Tweeting but things out, denouncing out, people. <laughs> yeah, they, you know, virtually, in a sense. They, you know, but, in, in, but, but they didn't want to do anything fast or precipitous. And starting in 1865, when it became clear that Johnson wasn't going to work with Congress, he didn't even call Congress back into session, they basically said, well, let's, let's try to work with him. Let's see what we can do. We don't want to alienate him. We don't want to drive him into you know, the, the arms of you know, whatever, what were called pop, copperheads or peace democrats. So let's, and they kept trying. And then more and more, as I said, the, the motives grew as he became more uh, vehement in his language, more clearly supremacist, more abusive, um, until, and, and, and at the same time, I should add, they, they, impeachment was sort of lurching forward. Congress was taking action, these, these Reconstruction Acts that Eric just mentioned. But it's lurching forward. In other words, it votes to look at impeachment, but then it goes to the Judiciary Committee. And then the Judiciary Committee investigates and investigates and looks for that legal you know, tripwire, and it can't find it. So they vote not to impeach. And then they change their mind because Johnson then is trying to stop the Reconstruction Acts from being executed. And so then Congress is still kind of slowly marching. It's not eager to do this. As I said, it's the first ever impeachment. And then slowly, and then they're passing other legislation, something called the Tenure of Office Act. It was later repealed. It was sort of a dubious act, but it was there to protect Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, because he was protecting the military, and the military was protecting the blacks and whites in the South who wanted to vote right. after the... It's, it's the, odd. That one of the strange things about Congress's Reconstruction policy is it puts it in the hands of the military. It, I know. And Johnson is the, had the commander-in-chief of the military, and yet Johnson is totally opposed to the policy that is now supposed well, to be implemented. what's interesting, when you ask how strategic his, right. he is, there are times when he's like, 
thick-headed. First of all, why did he keep Stanton in office that long? Stanton, he knew right. hated him, and he hated Stanton, but he hadn't fired him. Then, you're right, the military, he can appoint these generals. So he appoints generals, probably Grant told him who to appoint, right. and he hates the generals that he appoints because they're against him. Right. So he starts firing them. And you know, be, because of that, and then the tenure of office, and then he fires Stanton. And that is finally Congress. They can't, that's. Well, that's a violation. That's an that's exact an actual, violation of the law. That's a violation of a law just passed. And right. you want to talk about thumbing your nose at Congress. Right. You know, the, the, basically, Congress passes legislation. The chief executive officer of the country is supposed to enact the legislation. Right. But he violates it. But the, the, the articles of impeachment, this is now the spring of 1868, oh, I think there's 11 of them, right? But 11. most of them are about the Tenure of Office Act. They seem to accept the premise yeah. that you have to have a specific violation of law. Yep. The 11th one is kind of a catch-all that uh, talks about him insulting Congress and just right. being a generally obnoxious person and we really need to get rid of him. Uh, <laughs> Well, the tenth does that too, actually, because right. the tenth is it takes his speeches and puts it in the right. article and says, "Look at the kinds of things he's saying. He's actually calling for the execution of some of these Republicans." Yeah. You know, I mean, think of that. 1867. He's calling for the. I mean, it's unheard of to do that. In in so so they're actually using his own language against him. And then, as Eric says, the the eleventh article is catch-all, kitchen sink, omnibus article that basically Thaddeus Stevens and this other man. Um, named Ben Butler, great names, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's right out of Dickens, in a sense. And they, they basically put together an 11th impeachment article that is broader, so that they will have the broader outline of abuse of power in this particular case. And so they've got nine technical having to do with the Tenure of Office Act, and two that are not technical, and then the lawyers or the House of Representatives who, who prosecute the case against Johnson, and the lawyers that Johnson very, and this is strategic, very wisely hires with the help of his pal, William Seward, the Secretary of State, and he gets some really brilliant guys in there. One had been a Supreme Court justice, um, right. And you know, and, the, and they argued this out in the Senate. Meantime, one other thing, because it's ahead, important yeah. before I forget, is that the Chief Justice, Chase, who, who presides, is a man named Selman Chase, who wants to be president. He's, and he's angling, got a lot of power. Yeah, he's, he's angling for the Democratic nomination. He'll take either. Well, the Republicans <laughs> by this point wouldn't have him, but he was. And yeah, yeah. even as he's presiding right. over the Senate right. uh, trial, he's trying to get the Democratic right. nomination. Right, uh, right, uh, Which, so, and then also, the, what about Ben Wade? He's kind of in a funny ben position. Wade. He's in a funny position. Ben Wade is actually next in line for the presidency, and Ben Wade is considered the, if you forget Thaddeus Stevens and his club foot and the devil, Ben Wade is thought of as the most radical of the radicals. He, he's a senator from Ohio. From Ohio, has been in the Senate for a very long time, for a while, they don't even want him to vote because of his conflict of interest. Would he be would have become president had Johnson been convicted. Yeah, nobody wanted him because. But he said, votes anyway. Well, he votes anyway, but it doesn't help him. I mean, right. it doesn't help anybody. But in that, because of Ross, of course. Right. But the right. thing about Ben Wade is, among his radical positions, is the is voting rights for women. Right. So imagine He's how terrible it would be to have Wade in the presidency. Somebody said he'll put Susan B. Anthony in the cabinet. <laughs> that would be good. He, um, well, that means he's Wade also president. had given a speech in Kansas in 1867 saying now that the battle between freedom and slavery is over, the next battle is labor versus capital. That's right. That's and right. He, was, he is the only American quoted in volume Carl, one of Das Kapital by Karl yeah, Marx. Yeah. He quotes that speech to he say, does. look, even in America, people are coming to see the class struggle. Exactly. You know? uh, so a lot of people didn't want Ben Wade to become president. Uh, um, so in the end, as you said, by one vote, by right? One they vote. fall one vote short. Seven Republicans yes. vote to acquit. Yes, yes. And yes. that leads to them failing by one vote to remove Johnson, Johnson from, from office. office. Um, before we go to question and answer, let me just ask you, sure. uh, by the way, I should say there's a very vivid 
description in the book of the proceedings themselves and the trial, because usually when people write about this, they just say, all right, he's put on trial. But the actual, what actually happened in the Senate is fascinating, it and is. you explain this Thank very, you. very. Uh, it was wonderful reading. I just say as an aside, you know, for those people who think reading, you know, trial transcripts or the congressional record is dull, which I don't happen to think, it's really like theater. It's like reading plays. It's right. You might as well be reading, you know, uh, Sing or O'Neill yeah. or something. And the trial was like that. It was. It was. It was thrilling, really, in a sense. It's kind of law and order. So before we go to style. questions, let me just ask you, what do you think the consequences for um, reconstruction of the acquittal were? There were some, Trefus, for example, who taught in this building for yeah. a long time. Um, he felt that the failure of impeachment really weakened the radicals very dramatically, that it, it undercut their influence in the party. Others say no. It forced Johnson to stop being so annoying. For the, he's had another almost year, eight yeah, months, ten yeah. months, and he, they basically his lawyers said, "Look, if you acquit, uh, I, we make he'll behave himself from now on." We'll and watch he, over him. Like yeah, and he more Evers. or less did. So, yeah. do you think it was a mistake to impeach him? Do you think the, that it weakened Reconstruction, or that it actually enabled Reconstruction to go forward more effectively? I actually think it helped. Reconstruction go forward. I think that the process, and we didn't even talk about the role that Ulysses S. Grant played right, in it, right. and the process actually radicalized, if there's, if we want to use that word, in a sense, but certainly um, I think illuminated many issues for Grant, and so Grant, who did become the next president, as we all know could take steps that he, I don't know if he wouldn't have already, but certainly changed him in that way. And I think that those who had promised, because many of the people, even Democrats, I mean, nobody wanted to touch Johnson. Nobody was going to nominate him in 1868. And so in that particular sense, no one really had m much respect for him. And, he, and, and so that he was, he was um, let's say, uh, curtailed to a large extent. And some of the best legislation of Reconstruction, as you know in, in, Comes in your next the, book. Yeah. yeah, but, but, it's, but it's, it's, it's percolating at this time, certainly the 14th Amendment. And then it became you know, the way in which the southern states would be readmitted into the union. And that grants citizenship to process. I mean, that's important. And then the 15th Amendment. And you know that doesn't happen under Johnson. It could never have happened under Johnson. So I think it greased those wheels, in a sense. I don't think it was a, a mistake. But okay. what do you think, uh, by the way? I agree. <laughs> um, Johnson comes back, oddly. Yeah. The, the strange uh, ending does. of this is that in 1875, Tennessee sends him back to the uh, Senate as a, he, he ends his like life. Like a bad penny, you know? Right, he keeps, he, he keeps coming back. <laughs> I don't think uh, there's there any other. There were flowers other... on his desk. What? People there were flowers loved... on his desk. I don't think there's any other ex-president who served in the Senate. John Quincy Adams served in the, the House. House, yeah. And um, I guess William Howard Taft served on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, yeah. But uh, serving in the Senate uh, a, a, after being impeached, that's a kind of strange. It'd be like Bill Clinton being elected to the Senate. Why not? Maybe he will. Maybe he'll go to the Supreme Court. <laughs> right, that's a thought. Um, all right, we're going well, to we're going to open the floor here to questions. Uh, Thad will deal with the question situation. Yes. My question deals with this uh, tenure, uh, tenure act, of office act. Office act. Now, uh, di didn't the president have to sign that, or was it passed uh, over his over veto? Over his veto. Everything passed over his veto. He, he okay. vetoed everything, and uh, they okay. kept passing him over. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, is it true uh, Andrew Johnson was an alcoholic? And um, th there, was, there was something about, I thought that perhaps in his inaugural address, he was said to have been inebriated. In inebriated. Is that he, true? In, in his inaugural address as vice president, it was said that he took a shot or two or more of medicinal whiskey that had a bad uh, effect or it had a, was contraindicated by his 19th century cold medicine, whatever that might have been. <laughs> <Right>. More um, <laughs> whiskey. <laughs> yeah, from bourbon. 
and in which case it, it, it led him to kind of slobber over the Bible and be an incoherent speaker. Many people, you know, he had many detractors, as you might imagine, and, and even Sumner, who wasn't above, he was a wonderful man in many ways, but he wasn't above being catty, said that he saw, you know, um, big cases of bourbon going into Johnson's rooms at, at Kirkwood House when he lived there. Who knows? In other words, the word, the epithet alcoholic is a bit strong. I mean, we, it, it's a very kind of 20th century term in the sense. Somebody asked in the 19th century, you know, if Johnson drank, and, and the answer was everybody drank. Um, a lot of the intemperate, horrific, really, speeches he made, um, people would have liked to have um, attributed to his being drunk. And the sad truth was he wasn't in those cases. Right. <laughs> uh, how, how did the, the uh, senators who voted to acquit, uh, how did they fare in their future elections after that uh, trial? Um, I don't remember specifics right now, but um, it was, it, you know, again, the received wisdom is that they were all booted out of office or they all, you know, suffered ignominy. Um, Ross himself said that was true, and it wasn't true. Some of them just left, they, you know, um, oh, I'm thinking, what's his name? Well, Fessenden, Trump. Fessenden. Fessenden, Trumbull. And, you know, Fessenden died. Trump, he stayed in Trumbull office. Trumbull stuck but around. But Trumbull uh, stayed, he switched parties. He, became, he went back uh, to being uh, a Democrat. Eventually, he yeah. Um, so th th there was no punishment meted out to but them. But the, the, several of these seven men ended up, like Trumbull and Ross, ended up With in the liberal Republican movement. Right, this, right, this, right. Their votes for acquittal were the beginning of their retreat from Reconstruction altogether. And in 1872, they would be supporting Horace Greeley right. uh, against Grant right. uh, uh, on a platform of ending Reconstruction. So it was a, it was a symptom of their uh, becoming Perfect. less uh, enthusiastic about right. Reconstruction, even in 1868. Yeah, and it's also where you can start seeing how the Republican Party of then becomes the Republican Party of now. Yeah, so. but that takes a while. Yeah. But it's with the seeds, right. right? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. My, my question is, uh, what is the 1789 definition of high crime and misdemeanor? Because when we're talking about future impeachments, we have to look at what the, con what the, uh, con the, uh, the framers meant Right. by high crimes and misdemeanors, and I think they meant something in English common law or English statutory law. Yeah. law. So what has your research shown? My research shown is that there's a, an enormous array of opinion about, right. about that definition, even when they go back to 1789, and even when they look at English statutory law. And there's, you know, there's, a, there's there talk about the case of Warren Hastings in England and, and a lot of different opinions. And it really, you know, I hate to say it this way, but, um, so, but I will anyway. And that is, it really depends on the point of view or the sort of partisan point of view that, that one has. Even up until this day, as I said, I read books that were written in the 70s and then more recently. Mm -hmm. Um, that have a wide difference of opinion, and it really is, in a sense, in the best sense of the world word, I think it's a, a political determination. And right. I mean that in the best sense no, of no, the word. No, no, it is. I, I, I would be very cautious about thinking that you can find the yeah. single original right. intent for this or any other interesting or important subject. All these things have different inputs, different motivations, different definitions. So I would forget about what the framers said and yeah. think about what we think a high crime and a misdemeanor might, uh, might actually and, be. And good luck um, with that. I, I may have misheard what, uh, when you were speaking. Did you say that Seward was a, a supporter of Johnson? Yes, I yeah. did say well, that. Well, he, he stayed in the cabinet. He was still Secretary of State. Yeah. And he didn't want to leave the cabinet. He was a very, he was a very strong supporter of, um, of Johnson. And those who felt um, wrongly in certain cases that Johnson was an idiot, um, <laughs> blamed Seward for all the kinds of gestures that Johnson was making. I, I, that's an over-exaggeration, but it shows that Seward was, again, influential in, very influential. Although he, he tried to keep Johnson under control. Well, to a, yeah. You know, he'd tell him not to be so crazy in his uh, denunciations <laughs> of people. Yeah. Or to go along with the 14th Amendment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A no-brainer, really. Right. 
two quick ones. To what degree is our view of that reconstruction, that uh, rather, that impeachment bad because it failed? Is it a popular view? Would, if he'd been removed, would we think this was a triumph? And two, uh, just about the historiography of the case, the, there was a, a very good book by, a, I guess, a Scotsman or a Welshman, American, American Crisis in 1963. Rock, yeah. Rock. And he's for the impeachment. And then there's Michael Loves Benedict, Benedict in 1973. Yeah. And they don't get mm -hmm. that much attention. Um, what your thoughts on why that is? Well, you know, that I can address part of it. But go ahead. Brock is a, is an Englishman. He come. He's a very good historian. He he came. He, he's passed away now. But he he came from a country that doesn't have a written constitution. Right. They claim they have a constitution, but if you meet an Englishman, just ask him. Well, show it to me, and they'll run away. <laughs> get but, the Magna um, Carta. <laughs> but um, you know, and so they have a whole different concept of what uh, you know. What does it mean to violate the constitution, or what does it mean to uh, you know abuse power, etc. Uh, Benedict is a law professor. He's a good friend of mine. I, is, I, some is, of my best friends are law professors, although they, uh, they, they think in a weird <laughs> way. Um, so, uh, you know, Benedict had his own analysis. Th this was at the time of Nixon, right. as you said. Right. Trefus, Benedict, they were writing right, about right, right. Uh, impeachment right. from the point of view of the 1970s. Right. Also, I would say with Benedict, and I think it's a wonderful book, mm -hmm. really, and I think it opened up some discussion, not very much, um, but the, his analysis, which I thought, as I said, is brilliant, is very political analysis, you know, what the voting records of people were, what their affiliations were. He really sort of did a very kind of um, uh, taxonomic breakdown, mm -hmm. which I think is extremely useful. But I was interested in something else a little bit, and that was, as I said earlier when we started, what was it like to be on the ground? What was it like to be one of those people in the South who, uh, against whom black codes were being passed? Because it seemed to me that the kind of analysis Benedict did was, is wonderful, but I was interested in sort of the kind of felt experience um, that got behind and motivated the Johnson impeachment, which really had to do with the, with the lives of people and the vision of the country coming forward and not a strict sort of legalistic analysis. I think that would be fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious, uh, to what extent was impeachment then uh, sort of a, an act of congressional assertion? I mean, mm -hmm. we've become used to, ever since, let's say, Teddy Roosevelt, two very dynamic presidents. And yet, at that time, you just really had Jackson and you had a war president, Lincoln. Was there a different vision of the presidency at that point? And if so, did it influence the impeachment process? Well, that's a really interesting question. I mean, obviously, you're coming out of a war where, as you say, Lincoln's a very, such a strong president in many ways that a lot of people, particularly in the Democratic Party, but even some Republicans, hated him. I mean, because they thought he was usurping a certain amount of uh, power, Stanton too, you know, suspending habeas corpus. I mean, you can argue these were war measures, but it, it, they kind of uh, shook people up a little bit. Um, but, but, but impeachment itself is a congressional prerogative, so it does fall to the legislature to stop, and this goes back to the sort of framers, or who knows what they intended, but one thing I think is clear is that they're coming off a monarchy, and they certainly don't want pres the presidency to turn into that. So I don't think it's a question of a strong president versus weaker president. It has to do with really the fact that the country's at this crossroads at this particular time, and you have the, um, the, the legislature, which is the Congress, which is um, supposed to determine the qualifications of its own members, and you've got 11 seceded states, and they're being told, the Congress is being told that they can't determine the qualifications for those 11 secessionist states, the former Confederacy, to come back in. And this guy who's a Southerner is telling them, so you've got trouble right there. See what I'm saying in that sense? So. Congress was 
cognizant of its own powers and yeah. its own prerogatives, even under Lincoln, as you said. When the 13th Amendment was finally passed through the House of Representatives at the end of January 1865, mm -hmm. uh, all the members signed a copy of it. All right. the, and, and then Lincoln got a hold and he signed it, whereupon, yeah. whereupon the Senate passed a resolution telling Lincoln, you have no right to sign this. <laughs> a constitutional Go amendment, <laughs> has the president has no role in a constitutional That's amendment. Right. It's ratified by right. two thirds of Congress and three quarters and the of the state. states and the president has nothing to do with it and they didn't want him signing it because right. that would be right. uh, a, a, a usurp, usurping yeah. Congress's right. authority. Right, 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 right. So they're aware, yeah. Uh, yeah, could you give a flavor of the trial? What were the most prominent arguments on each side? What? The, the trial oh. itself. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's very complicated to make it very simple or simple-minded in a certain sense. The, I, I think that the best way to make those arguments um, uh, comprehensible just in a, in a quick question and answer period is to say that there was the narrow view, as I said, the sort of crabbed view, the legalistic view of impeachment versus the broader view. And it would seem that the prosecutors, the people who wanted Johnson out of office, would take the broader view because he, for all the reasons I've enumerated, unfit for office. The irony was that the Johnson defense team William Everts and Benjamin Curtis, and, you know, as I said, very estimable, very brilliant people, took the broader view, and they were basically talking about the dignity of the presidency and maintaining that dignity against uh, Congress and the kind of nig uh, and the kind of um, uh, legalistic determination of the Tenure of Office Act, which they said he hadn't violated because. The act was worded so ambiguously. So it really came down. So the, so the managers, the House, is, is arguing in very sort of small legalistic terms. And they lose in that particular sense because they don't really, they don't really paint, as I say, with a broad enough brush in that particular way. It's, it's we will have to probably uh, call this to a halt soon. Maybe, no. what do you think, one more question? OK. Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you summarize uh, why, um, which from the Democratic or the Republican side would be happy to see him gone, and why? They'd both be happy to I see think him gone. But, 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 but why? <laughs> what were the, the politics behind it? Why would they be happy? Be because, well, you know, I mean, I, th I think that's what we've been discussing in a certain sense, is that his vision for the country, whether, you, whether your vision was one of the, the radical or progressive, what do you, whatever you want to call them, Republicans who saw a free and just and, and country based in equality, I mean, he was uh, obstructing that, or if you were really sort of a, a Democrat who felt, let's keep the state's rights, and let's keep presidential power curtailed. I mean, the irony is this president is usurping presidential powers, and he's supposed to be a Democrat who really wants to give power back to the states in that particular way. So, so he's basically, and, and he'd been so difficult in terms of political strategies, as I said before, the Democrats were saying, just go along with the 14th Amendment, just, just placate these Republicans, and we can move forward, you know, in that sense. And, and so the Democrats, the Democratic press, which was enormously partisan, they didn't want to have anything to do with him either. So a plague on his house. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, thank you very much, thank Brenda, you. and thank congratulations you, on the book. Thank you, Eric.